that's the last conscious memory I have other than becoming aware as I was sinking underwater and then realizing as I was screaming, that was my air. And so I was like, oh my God, that's my air. You know, I can't breathe in. Oh my God. Oh my God. I remember that sheer instant of panic. But as soon as I said, well, I'm going to die in my mind, as soon as I said that I was released from my body and I was above it. Welcome to the crossroads of the known and the unknown. This is AJ Paz, Spiritual Journalist Podcast. Okay, welcome. We're going to be sharing with our multiple near-death experiencer, Lorelai Drake. Hello, Lorelai. Hi, AJ. Thank you for having me today. Well, I'm glad you're back. We're going to be talking about a near-death experience she had when she was only seven years old. This is part of a collection of childhood near-death experiences I've been gathering for my next book, and I invited her to share her story. So uh, please, Lorelai, what can you tell us about the girl you were before having this experience? What happened during the experience and what were the consequences? Um, well, I remember being very uh, carefree as a young girl. I grew up on 191 acres in rural uh, Wisconsin. Um, so I kind of had free roam of our farm and we had five ponds, which led to my near death experience at seven. Um, so before that, I just remember being very happy, kind of carefree, um, kind of very innocent in the sense of not, not so aware of the world, even though my mother said even prior, like as soon as I could talk, she said I was an old soul and he couldn't tell me anything. You know, I was always uh, trying to give everybody a different perception of why things were occurring. But as far as the incident of my near-death experience, that particular day, um, my aunt and uncle who lived across the street were over. And um, I'm not sure where the rest of my siblings were. It was just me and um, my oldest brother, <clears throat> who is six years older than me, and my aunt and uncle and my mother. Um, I know my dad was working. He, he worked at Chrysler. Uh, I just remember being in the kitchen and... Um, my mother was trying to cook supper. She was chopping up vegetables for chili or something. She she had started that. Um, when my brother asked to go, not necessarily fishing, I'm not sure. Um, but I do know he wanted to go down to the fishing pond. I think they did bring the fishing equipment. And so the ponds were probably maybe a mile away from um, the actual house. And so we walked back there, me, my aunt, my uncle, and my older brother. My mom didn't want me underfoot, so said, take your sister. So um, the particular pond we went to, uh, when the rains were high, uh, would be connected. So the two ponds um, at this point were connected. Um, I, so I want to believe it's spring because uh, they were checking for the bluegills spawning. And that was at the first, because um, they spawn in shallower water. So it was at the first pond. Um, I asked my aunt to go to the deeper one where we normally swimmed. Now that was 30 foot deep. Uh, these these ponds were created uh, because um, they were a quarry at one time and they, they struck the live springs. And so all the quarry flooded. Anyway, so my my uncle and my brother had stopped at that first entrance. My aunt and I continued down to the other through like an arched uh type uh, path. I say this so you can understand that they didn't have a visual on me. Um, so then I came to uh, there's like an embankment and then a pier that they hand built. So it was like made from pallets and posts. Um, my aunt didn't like water. She couldn't swim. So she stayed up on, on, on the embankment. Um, I, I climbed down and went out to the end of the pier to look at the water. Um, and I want to say it was late afternoon, just by where the sun was. Uh, cause, it, um, so I was standing there on the right side of the pier and the way it was hitting the water, cause it, it was sunset, um, was very mesmerizing. I felt like I was being sucked into the water. So I moved to the left, you know, because I felt like I was going to fall in. Um, at this time is when my aunt asked if she could uh, go check on my uncle and my brother. Um, she seemed to have kind of, I will just say, like a separation anxiety. She never liked to be far from him or not knowing what he was doing. 
Uh, a lot of people say, well, why would you leave a child so young, seven years old on a pier, right? But um, I want to, people to understand that that's like the early 70s, uh, late 70s, early 80s. And, you know, we were a farm family. I had a lot of responsibility by the time I was seven. It's kind of a different, um, a, 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 just, just, just a different culture almost, right? Um, so anyway, my aunt went to do that. And I, I remember looking back for her and she was already headed down that tree covered path. And um, that's the last conscious memory I have other than becoming aware as I was sinking underwater. The odd thing about this to this day that makes me question um, how exactly I got in the water, if there was some sort of divine or because uh, my other experience, you know, the, the galactic interference, because I was thinking feet first. Now, if you normally sway and fall, you fall head first. I mean, at least from my um, experiences, but I was foot first thinking when I became aware of my body again, and I was yelling out um, and then realizing as I was screaming, that was my air. And so I was like, oh my God, that's my air. You know, I can't breathe in. Oh my God, oh my God. I remember that sheer instant of panic, but as soon as I said, well, I'm going to die, in my mind, as soon as I said that, I was released from my body and I was above it. And as soon as I was outside of my body, like I could perceive like the lower area of where I was just the pond, my brother, my uncle, my aunt. But also the interesting part about this is like I was able to completely be one with their consciousness. I knew what they were thinking. So my brother was thinking, could he swim to me faster or run through the trail that my aunt was down? Um, by this time, I assume my aunt, I remember, you know, um, I think she heard me fall in yelling for my uncle. I, I just remember this as if I had viewed it. Um, and so he was thinking, which could he do? And me out of body. And I didn't even care about my body. That's the strange thing. And I was laughing in spirit because I was like, you can't do either. What? Why are you even thinking that? You know, to me, it was like comical. Um, and then I went to like my uncle's consciousness next. And he was more like, you know, they're going to play much. Oh my God, how did this happen? Why'd she leave her alone? You know, those type of questions. And then um, it came back to my aunt. By that time she had made it to uh, the end of the pier and was trying to figure out since she didn't know how to swim, if she could hang on and kind of reach and scoop me or pull me in, what, what would happen? You know, and she, and she, her main thought was like, if I don't do this right, we're both going to drown. You know, that was her fear. We're both going to drown. Um, and so she grabbed on and um, from the what I saw of it was like trying to scoop and pull my body. I could just see my hair. I had long hair like I do now, just like kind of floating, like because I, I was in the water. Um, but I'm not sure if she got me or my uncle, to be honest. Because um, my next awareness, awareness of the actual body uh, was that I was up already on the embankment on my side, you know, to make sure I didn't have water in my lungs. And I didn't. I had no adverse effects. But there's more to this experience. As, as I connect with all of their consciousness, then I kind of like, I felt at peace. So I rose higher and I could see for miles. And the next thing I did was check on my mother's consciousness back in the kitchen. I saw her cooking and she was thinking if we caught anything, how soon would we be back? Would supper be done by the time we got back? Um, and as soon as I just checked in with her, I was like gone. I, I don't have any other memories of like the earthly you know, plane, so to speak. Next thing I had conscious memory of, I was in this place, um, just felt like there was like clouds and mist, like I was in the clouds. Um, I could sense that there was someone with me, like a guide or something to my left, but I, I couldn't physically see them or a body for myself. Um, the only thing I remember seeing is I was looking up off to the left, there was this huge like archway and I felt like a tiny little ant compared to it, I will say. And this overreaching, over expansion of this light, it was like bright, brilliant white. But then as it stretched out, you know, it became like bright yellow, orange to a deep amber. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of created a illustration of it. But um, and within it, there was this being in my illustration, I had to darken it just so that you could see there was a being, but like, I couldn't even make out this being. I could just tell there was one. It was just the tiniest of shadow, but the light that emitted was so expansive compared to the being. 
But the thing with that was there was just an overwhelming, and I'm sure people hear this all the time, but of love, peace, and just contentment, a, a sense of home. But the love was like a maternal love times like 10,000, just like the light. I mean, the light that admitted, I kept remembering like, you know, like searching for a body, like, do I have a body? And it's going to burn my eyes. I can't, how can I be looking at this? It was like looking at the sun, you know? And I was like, um, just overwhelmed. Like what, what, what is this place? Um, some often ask if I had like the memory of a seven-year-old or a spirit. And I often felt kind of both like my personality. And from what I've learned through all my NDEs, your personality doesn't quite change. <laughs> I'm still stubborn and still, you know, find everything um, joyful. So through this, um, I remember speaking with this being, it was more telepathic. And I know I was shown things, but I do not remember. The only thing I remember about the experience is that it felt like for eons, I was arguing with it that, no, you could not make me go back to that. I'm not going back to my body. I'm not going back to that story. I'm There's no way you can make me. And that felt like it went on for a long time in our, in our human sense of time, right? But um, then this voice and this one wasn't telepathic it reminded me on the Truman show like when they went through the audio you know like it was all around me yet in me and it goes you must go back you have more to do it was like this deep authoritative male voice and I was like you're like okay you know I'll go back but I remember thinking you can make me go back do not make me get in that body like like I'll go back to it I so when I became back aware of my body I was like next to it but not in it and kind of with it you know almost how they describe like when babies and what i've seen of of new souls coming in where they're like hanging around the mother right it's kind of like that like i'm with my body that's good enough (laughs) and honestly i feel like i stayed that way for about a year to be honest like i would not connect with my body per se i was more out than in um but i didn't according to my family and my remembrance i didn't really speak till the next day i didn't have like i mentioned any ill effects but I remember um, we grew up in like a 200 year old farmhouse, uh, a lot of Victorian furniture and things. And I was sitting in one of those, you know, those wood captain type chairs that were at the ends of the dining table. But this was at the end of our, our long step. And I remember sitting there and talking to my brother, telling him what he was thinking and doing while I was drowning. And so that was pretty profound because I mean, he turned wide his jaw drop. He's like, you know, there's no way I could know that. You know, and I remember telling my mother that I had died. And the biggest thing coming back that I thought was quite interesting is I told my mother I wanted to be a preach. I was supposed to, a priest. I was supposed to teach people. And um, she goes, honey, in our religion, which I was raised loosely Catholic, but my generations before that we were very strict Catholic. Um, and she's like, honey, you can't be a priest in our religion. And I told her, well, then that's not my religion. Nature is my church. And that's all I want to do with that. And I also used to say I wanted to live in a cabin alone in the woods. <laughs> but it was kind of interesting in full circle that, you know, now I teach and, I, you know, and I'm a minister. So it's kind of interesting. It, it did come full circle that way, but that I knew that. The other thing I came back with that I would like to share real quick is um, an analogy. Like I remember going on and on as a child about butterflies because they had given me the analogy that we're like in the we're like a butterfly, but we're in the larval stage of like the human evolution. And what we're going through now, according to my spirit team, is more like the chrysalis moments is what I call it, where our DNA and we're being completely rearranged to, you know, be more in tune with our light bodies. So they had showed me all that. So butterflies were huge after um, my first near death experience. And I don't know if you want me to get into the changes right away, but there, there was a lot that transpired because of that experience. Well, that's really interesting, Lorelai. I was thinking, you know, that a lot of kids who have uh, these types of experiences, they have a hard time integrating their experience, understanding, and also uh, becoming part of, of their family, once again, of society, integrating with, with people. So what can you tell me about that? That was very difficult to me. I, I honestly, sometimes now I refer to being like I was the time, uh, timeline transplant because it literally felt that I didn't come back to the same family. I mean, I did, but they seemed different or at least treated me different. Um, 
my mother was a big advocate for my experiences because I became pretty psychic after that. I had a lot of prophetic uh, dreams and knowing. And for a small child, that was very hard, you know, because sometimes you were like, if you couldn't stop somebody from doing something, it's like, did I create it? Did I make it happen? Why, why couldn't I stop this from happening? Um, like I, I remember, um, knowing if, and sensing if people were going to die and they looked like wax dummies and, um, you know, like their skin was glossy and melty as the soul energy was preparing to leave. Um, and they always passed away within like two weeks of me sensing that. And I, sometimes I become very like ill, almost like, like a, a rock in the pit of your stomach kind of thing. And, and, and I just knew something was coming, but I didn't always know what it was. And I'm not sure like if that's because of everything I was shown in my NDE that might transpire that were traumatic events or not, but I just had this knowing I mean, later in, in my childbearing years and I had when I was having children that I predicted, you know, child souls coming in up to a year away and what their sexes were. So so it kind of switched to something brighter. I did ask not to see, you know, the wax dummies. It was too frightening as a child, like for people to look that way. They just looked unreal. Um, but as far as my family, you know, I. I had a really hard time integrating because I was all about truth. I even became, you know, the show Wonder Woman was on back then. I became obsessed with their lasso of truth because I was like, that's me. You know, like I could see people's truth and I would call them out on it. I was a young child. I didn't know any better. I didn't have the discernment not to say certain things. Or if somebody was lying, I'd say, oh, no, this is the truth. And they, you know, uh, you know, especially in front of other people. So there was a lot to integrate because, um, Kids would say, you're weird, but in a good way, you know, like they didn't know how to take me. Uh, my brothers became very almost hateful, um, which wasn't the case prior to my experience. Um, it was almost like a jealousy. They became abusive in some ways. I don't even want to get into that, but I'm just saying, so it, it was a big change. And, and I remember even my dad to be like, well, I trust Lori because she'll tell me the truth you know, which really would upset my family, you know, like, like, I don't believe you, you know, if she tells me I will, there was just a lot of weirdness. Um, but like I said, it got where I was correct enough that people would just take, like, if I said this was going to happen, they took precaution, you know? Um, so that was a real good, that helped me heal in some ways, because it was kind of a validation. Or my mother would sometimes, it was somebody I didn't want to reach out to, but I had a vision of something they were going through, or, or if they were like, suicidal or whatever you know she'd have people reach out to them so I always had that buffer until she passed you know um but that I think is my main thing as far as integration I remember all I would do is sit on my swing a lot it made me feel as free and out of body as I was and I used to sing this weird almost angelic I would call it music like it wasn't like I had actual words it was just these beautiful sounds I remember that and excuse me, my hair. And um, we had a metal barn roof. So it would echo through the neighborhood. People would be like, what's she singing? But um, so I was very often alone, either in the woods or doing that for the majority of my childhood, probably till later middle school, you know. Um, and in that time, I mean, I know this isn't part of the discussion, but, you know, I had a lot of um, spirits around interdimensional beings, galactic, experiences so it is just kind of turned my life into a surreal sci-fi I, I don't know so it was just it, it was complicated you know a lot of people try to glorify NGE and it, you know not oh, I shouldn't say a lot of people but you know like oh I wish I had one you know but there's there's a lot to it and a lot of self-work of healing afterwards and finding who you are again because you you were this expansive like star light you know, and coming back to this body, it's like a genie in the lamp experience and, and having to reintegrate all that was very challenging. I guess. So did you understand that you had died when you were seven or did this take uh, some time to realize? Also, uh, when did you learn that this had been a near death experience? Well, I told, you know, my mom that um, I had died uh, like I knew because I, as soon as I said I had died, I was there. Um, so I think I did correlate that right away. Um, but I didn't know about near death experiences or the spirit world 
much until I want to say almost to the Montel Williams show with uh, Sylvia Brown talking about departed spirits and things. And I was like, wow, people talk about this. And, you know, and she was talking about different things. I don't think she brought up the near death experience, but that made its way to me. And um, I don't think honestly, like I put that term to it till I found the near death experience group read by Ned Badea um, on Facebook. And I was like, oh, you know, and I read what it was and I was like, oh, okay. So that's what it's considered when you die and come back, you know, cause to me, I, I died, you know, I didn't know. Um, so I, I think that's more when I correlated the term and then I was referred to IAMS and well, that's <laughs> a, a ongoing story, but yeah. So I, I want to say, you know, and being part of IAMS and that group gave me a lot of the terminology, like I knew these spiritual things in that, but I didn't know they were happening to other people. I didn't know what they were called, you know, so I'm so thankful for more of a vocabulary thanks to, you know, the places that I came in contact with later in life in my, I think I found most of those just within the last, I don't know, six, eight years. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, great. So right now you are an active member of IANS. You're also a facilitator. Mm -hmm. You are the uh, social media co coordinator. Why can you tell us about uh, what you're doing presently and how can people participate in your meetings? As you mentioned, I'm very involved with IANS and I have the IANS Central Missouri group that meets every second Thursday evening at 6 p.m. Central. Um, but uh, I just I'm doing my best to give back to that community for uh, helping and supporting me. And like I said, giving me the language I feel it's an integral part of uh, the healing and integration process. I'm just so thankful for all the work everyone since it was created has put into that space. Um, I created my own space about two years ago, more for the expansion of consciousness. It's um, And I have an event that's called Celebration of Consciousness every first Sunday of the month where I have multiple speakers and uh, people that teach different types of healing and spiritual modalities to give the collective access to these and expand them. That was given to me by spirit. There was a whole download how to create the celebration of consciousness. And it's kind of like my baby, so to speak. And it, I, I'm told by a lot of people, there's beautiful energies there. But uh, I also run a seekers and sharing group uh, Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Central. And uh, anyone is welcome to that. That That is about the expansiveness of consciousness. So it covers the metaphysical, the multidimensional. Uh, we kind of deep dive into everything and support each other. So it's it's a beautiful group. They, they come to call each other family. And I'm just happy to hold that space, just like the IAN family that I have found. So I have gained so many so much spiritual family through these organizations and my own platforms. Um, and I do sessions with people as well. So um, I'm a Reiki master teacher, but I also was given a lot of my, I have all the clear abilities. So I just, my thing is just giving back. And I call myself a remembrance guide. I never say I'm a healer because all of us have that within us in, in my experiences. So, you know, I just guide people back to self like their true self, you know, the light and the divinity that we come from. So that's why I say remembrance guides. So, and um, yeah, and I, I'm doing some workshops coming up this week and next month uh, with IANS as well, teaching how to become a divine conduit, which is what I kind of say, you know, when you have these experiences, um, you're able to connect with that divine energy and, and let it flow through you to help others. So that's pretty much where, where I'm at in um, all the things that I'm doing. It keeps me rather busy, but I I don't know. That's where I find my joy is watching people expand and find their own awareness. It, it's just so beautiful to me. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I congratulate you because you're doing a great job. Also, I'm, I want to include the links uh, mm -hmm. under this video so people can uh, join your groups or contact you. And uh, please... Uh, send them to me send send the links of the uh, uh the events you, that you're going to be holding soon and also any other information okay i'd be happy to and i i thank you so much for this platform because the more spaces there are for us to speak you know the more people can connect to it and have their own expansion and remembrance so i'm just so happy to hold space thank you mm -hmm.
And this has been the AJ Parr Spiritual Journalist Podcast. Please like, share, and subscribe.